Good afternoon and good morning. Welcome to the Learning from Global Exposure to COVID panel. My name is Lourdes Casanova, and I am a faculty and director of the Margin Markets Institute at Cornell University in Ithaca, upstate New York. And today I'll be chairing this session. India is both the destination and origin of investments from IT to pharmaceuticals, automotive, hotels, banks, the names of Indian companies like Data Consultancy Services, Bipro, Mahindra, the startup Oyo or State Bank of India have become household names and leaders in their fields. Many Indian companies like those I mentioned have embarked on a global path leading growth, but most importantly, leading the learning for Indian companies and by Indian companies. Managers leading successful global business need deep knowledge and have to be able to attract talent and have cultural awareness. What are the main challenges facing Indian firms expanding abroad? In this, what some call post-globalization world post-COVID, are there still incentives to go global for Indian companies that they have such a great and big uh, domestic market? Is there an increasing need for Indian companies of whom taken over by a foreign firm? To discuss all these issues and more that are very key for the Indian industry, we have a great global panel from India, Tarun Anand, Chairman and Founder, Universal Business School, Rajiv Lutra, founder and managing partner of Lutra and Lutra from Brazil. Thank you, Marcelo, for joining. Marcelo de Andrade, partner, Earth Capital Holdings. And from Germany, Heinz Dolberg, executive vice president, retired of Alliance. Of Alliance. And then Eva Lota Schettstedt, who is joining us from Sweden and is member of the supervisory board of Metro in Germany. So we'll start the introductory remarks by uh, asking both Tarun and Rajiv, successful Indian firms going abroad in the different sectors, manufacturing, service, genetics, in pharmaceutical, what are the achievements and the main challenges they are facing? So Tarun, the floor is yours. I will ask you, please, uh, your introductory remarks of seven minutes. So please. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to be on this fantastic panel with leaders from four continents uh, and five countries. So it's great to be on this panel. Um, so I'm going to take a little bit of a macro view. Uh, you know, the GDP of India um, is near $2.5 trillion. We want to get to $5 trillion. That's what is the ambition. Uh, United States uh, did this in 10 years time. Japan did it in eight years time. China in five years time. So uh, where will India stand in this game, right? Only nine countries have a $2 trillion uh, plus um, GDP. So India is clearly a massive market, right? That is why multinationals from all over the world come to India because they want a piece of the action. China has been the factory of the world. Uh, and uh, of course, we are hoping with the pandemic, we get a slice of that action, but cannot we can think a little beyond. Of course, we want the manufacturing. Can India become the office of the world? We were very su successful in being the back office of the world. Can we be the front and back office? So uh, to answer that question, we need to understand the competitiveness of India. Now, India has several advantages from a geopolitics perspective. We're not looking for global domination. We thrive on economics and we want to lift the masses out of the poverty, right? We are a large English speaking nation, and that's the currency of communication around the world. Uh, we have superior management talent. We've seen that with the top global companies, whether it's Google or Microsoft headed by Indians. Uh, we, we like to position ourselves as the soft power versus China. Uh, you know, we are the land of spiritualism. We are the land of yoga, uh, the land of the inner journey. So that's what we have to go back to our strengths. Can we pivot to become a 24 by 7 economy? Can we become a more productive economy? Forget the R's. Um, can we do more with less? Uh, you know, frugal innovation is what India needs because we have a large 
number of people still below the poverty line can we manage scale at that level uh, you know our domestic economy has done that which is extremely attractive can we do that across borders uh, the other thing going for us is the ownership and management combination right in most parts of the world they are separated i think that's a huge advantage uh, in india but of course whilst we have these advantages the challenges india faces is you know raising capital we need tons of capital now reliance has done that by raising 40 billion dollars and showed the path uh, with investments from facebook kkr and general atlantic can other indian in- companies follow suit uh, you know can we get a mas- massive focus on learning the cross cultural magic right can we navigate the goal, globe we you know i personally have faced a several several attacks of racism of course because of the turban uh can that be navigated with a you know solid head on your head uh, uh shoulders um can we treat this uh, covid-19 as the digital rubicon which you know creates a bridge like what i call the c19 bridge to acquire the tech skills and lead um can we function at scale uh, bajaj auto tata consultancy uh, tata group per se they've done that infosys wipro have done that can we do that across all the areas is going to be the area where i would like us to focus on india needs to invest in ai and ml you know uh, at a board level there needs to be clear cut direction that we need to invest in these areas uh, and focus on this new change where people are at home so we can you know target the right markets uh, india needs to build new cost structures right uh, forecast costs on a worst case scenario make sure that we have the right cost structures in place so that we can compete globally and finally i would like to say you know the supply chains uh, between us and china have been decoupled right from just in time to resilient and adaptable supply chains are uh, the, of the order so can improve uh, india get to the heart of this you know we we ourselves in india face a large issue with freight costs within the country so how do we compete globally if we can't make sure that within the country we have the right uh, economics around this so i i would like to end by saying you know we need to build a um, uh, the boards need to look at experimentation build out the risk mu- muscle and i think from a sunrise perspective i think this could be the rise of india if we get this right hmm. over to you rajiv thank you thank you that was a, a tough act to follow uh, but being a lawyer i'll just get into a little more detail see one of the things that india has uh, is bereft is good infrastructure now in order to build good infrastructure we need long term money we used to have that in the past we used to have various what i call development banks which gave 15 year 20 year money today most of those banks too and others have become what i call commercial banks you get 5 7 year money for a 25 year project and that is a, a serious issue so we have we've have looked at it in a number of places to try and see how can we build institutions or lending institutions to give long term money so there are a few thoughts i have and uh, where we can solve this problem fairly easily but there are some political and other issues uh, doing that so as far as i'm concerned if we can solve our infrastructure problem we solve a whole gambit of things employment unemployment we solve the whole issue of this whole crowding of uh, factories near mumbai and pune and delhi and the urban cities if we can get a proper you know build better ports better airports all of that uh, it can change the whole scene in india it will make investment that much easier and then of course we have a gambit of laws which are quite archaic in many ways they need to be sorted out we have a huge uh, backlog in our courts and our judicial system so when a especially from a developed country where the judiciary etc is much quicker you get results much quicker the rule of law is though we have a rule of law but there's always some delay or the other and there are reasons for that now if we can attack those reasons my humble opinion all of this can be solved fairly quickly i'll give you one example 
today we have almost 67 to 68 percent of all cases that are pending in all courts in India. Government is on one side or the other, or government instrumentality. Now, why is it that they are there? They are there because we have uh, what I call the three C's. The Central Bureau of Investigation, the Central Vigilance Commission, and the Controller Auditor General of Accounts. These three institutions look at what the bureaucrats are doing wrong. Nobody looks at what bureaucrats are doing right. <laughs> so the tendency is the tendency is not to do anything. Because if you do something, something will go wrong. <laughs> that's the whole system. It's not nobody's fault, but that's what the system really encourages. Do nothing. <laughs> you know, for example, I mean, you're, uh, I was hearing earlier that some of you are on some airline boards. If, a, if an airline doesn't fly planes, they'll have perfect everything. All their statistics will be perfect on time, no crash, all of that. <laughs> you don't fly. So all of this can be settled. Now, let's say the government tomorrow morning on this Tuesday morning, raise it, tells it, it's, uh, their own, the government and their instrumentalities that all matters if the government loses, let's say, uh, uh, half a million dollars, then no further appeal. It will not become precedent and no further appeal. And let's withdraw all the cases that are pending at those numbers at different levels and have different amounts of money. We can almost have Justice in a year. I've done the calculation. So I think there are solutions and fairly quick ones. But they are, they are again, as usual, when you have quick, uh, quick solutions, they look too simple sometimes. And then it's the, it's, some of it is the politics, some of it is the bureaucracy. But we have to get through that. And this is the time to do it. My view with the COVID uh, pressure, a lot of things will be accepted by various parts of the system. And it can be solved. Mm. Oh, you're very right. Thank you very much, uh, Tarun and Rajiv. Excellent introductory remarks. And I love the word of sunrise for India. <laughs> and also the need for solving infrastructure and also uh, have a more agile uh, legal system. So we'll move now to uh, having the perspectives from another emerging market an emerging market that was in that very exclusive uh, club of the two trillion economies, not anymore. It was still recently bigger economy in GDP nominal than India, but now India, very rightly so, has surpassed Brazil. So why emerging multinationals should go global in the success factor? So I will ask first Mauri Ma Marcelo de Andrade, and then Eva Lota with her experience in boards to give us some views. Marcelo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, indeed a tough follow, uh, act to follow from the, my two previous colleagues. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, well, Brazil is this the forever sleeping giant, as they say. It, 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 has, it, it has moments of wake up and then it goes sleeping again. And uh, as, as mentioned to our colleague about India, Brazil's government is not exactly uh, an exemplary one. However, we do have tremendous uh, potential and the elements of marrying the, the need and the demand for the world and what Brazil is good at, it's enormous. Brazil is the only real industry that is booming in Brazil today is the agribusiness. We have land, we have technology, and we can produce. But still, from Brazil, if you go into, into Brazilian companies going international or in Indian companies going international, they have pretty much the same motivation. And once it, it, it has to go to other developing economies, it can go to, for example, software industries can go to the U.S. or to, or to, um, to America or to Europe. But uh, most of the industries also that our countries are good, they go and explore developing countries. And 
I'd like to 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 pose a uh, uh, to propose a, a, a look into the bottom of the pyramid approach because all of our countries have this this particular developing country, especially big countries, big population countries like India and Brazil, with a lot less population, but they still have the same problem. In the developing countries, it looks like. With, with the IFC, we have developed uh, um, uh, a structure called the Shared Value Platform, where we piggyback on the financial muscle that goes into a given region from infrastructure investments. And I have seen in India, uh, we have studied with some, uh, some colleagues and some old friends of mine that are uh, prominent Indian uh, businessmen and, and, and scholars. Uh, that concept applied to um, positive impact on the bottom of the pyramid on the influence areas of large scale infrastructure investments. In the case that we studied was energy, pretty much. So it was... The, the grid is not complete, so therefore you need off-grid potential. Off-grid potential can comes with new technologies that you can generate power, and then that 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 you can expand the communications. For example, telecom, the towers of of, of um, telecom can become off-grid uh, energy generations. But the point is, once a large infrastructure. In this, uh, investment like a big road or a port or a mining operation or oil or a port once those large infrastructure comes in come into a region and the investment come into a region that are not prepared to receive that investment usually the world sees there is an enormous negative impact because those are capital intensive industries they are not labor intensive industries so they create an illusion of development, an illusion of wealth, and migration happens, and all of the elements that 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 that, that, that attract people to an investment like this. But they never realize themselves because the, the labor is very spe specialized, and the bottom of the pyramid is not specialized to take on that job. So frustration comes, follows, and then social unrest follows. So we can use. And we have done this with using this methodology of the shared value platform. Use the financial muscle and manage the process of that money flowing into the region and enhancing and delivering a very appropriate uh, and very um, catered anchor economic structure for the base of the pyramid that goes in parallel to the big investment. The big investment can even become a partially a market for that new economy. But usually you have a boom and a bust. When you have, when you're building the infrastructure, you have an enormous amount of people involved. And when you're operating it, that drops down to a small fraction. So that needs to be embedded into the structure. I won't go into the details of the system, how it, how it operates. I'm happy to do so if, if uh, time time allows. But uh, but that's something we have experimented and proven time and time again, and we're going into a much larger scale operation now. Uh, we're doing it in LATAM, in Africa, at, but not yet in Asia. And India would be a fantastic place to do that, involving local multinationals and multinationals from abroad that are inside India. But the point is, if India can the international, multinational companies from India can adopt a concept like this and lead its implementation in other parts of the world using something like this. It can use the advantages that the multinationals from India understand how developing economies work because it comes from one. So it's a bigger, much bigger advantage uh, than a company that comes, a multinational that comes from a developed country. So I'm just this, this methodology of share value platform is just an example of how multinational Indian companies can use its advantage of coming from a from a, a developing country like Brazil and applying that in other developing economies. And I think my time is up, and happy to continue later. Thank you very much, Marcelo.
And now uh, the floor is yours, Eva. Lota, from your perspective of being in a number of boards, how do you see this uh, new world, this post-COVID world, and the increasing risk that we are seeing? Uh, and how should uh, what is the success factors that uh, make companies succeed in all over the world? Thank you. Yes. Uh, I would like to just t take a step back and, and refer a little bit to what happened in India 2014. And with that, I'm never going to claim myself being an expert in India. I think what uh, my previous panel speakers said, Rajiv and Tarun, they are very much more giving insights on India as such. But I would like to mention then the movement of, of India opening up from the government from 2014 and also the uh, the World Bank, the, the way they measure in how to do global trade. Actually, in, India seems to have taken a big leap in, in wanting to, to do so. So I base my insight very vaguely on that. But uh, I would also like to say, as a global, I worked as a CEO before I, I joined the board. So as a global leader, as a global citizen, I have some insights that I like to share, no matter what country you are in. Um, and, and I think particularly, though, to say India, uh, and I think, Tarun, you mentioned that being a very spiritual country, it's, it's a symbol of where you can actually align different cultures, different personas and different individualities to join forces into something deeper that means something for everyone. Uh, and that is also a little bit back to the deep roots of leadership when you go abroad to any kind of business, any industries, uh, that you need to embrace the, the local culture and the local personas in way of behaving and acting, as well as understanding yourself and where you come from. Uh, and in that, you need to encompass as well the business idea you bring with you. Uh, and I think the balance of getting that right is the difficult thing because if you enter a market with a business idea and believe that everything you have is exactly what they need something is wrong because you need to start to listen you need to balance the insights from that market and from that culture as well to define your offer to define your proposal to make it in the right balance so i would say understanding the local needs as well as where you come from globally is a key fundamental factor to succeed going global. Um, a second thing, when you go back to the culture and the leadership, uh, we see that more and more. It's been it's been talked about for a long, long time, but it's about you need to define your purpose beyond the business idea as a leader, as a company. So defining the real purpose, why you are doing business, actually your pure part of existence, it's not enough anymore just to talk about what you will provide but it's also more the long term. And that impacts as well the sustainable and the social engagement. Um, luckily for us, I think the younger generation, the, the millennials and, and the generations to come beyond that is showing us the way in a way of describing that actually they want leaders who not just do great growth and gives prosperity in, in, in mon monetary terms, but also who can provide a global world that is better for the future. And that goes back to sustainability, social responsibility and all that. So the days are over, I think, when you want to go global and as a leader, you can sit and say, OK, I have this great proposition and that is not encompassing taking bigger care of the planet and the people that we live in. Um, and the third factor, which everyone talks about and, and has talked about for years and years and years to come, is, of course, technology. And I think a basic fundamental proof when you go global is it's an amazing tool to connect. We see that just in this forum today. The ability to connect through to technology is something we should all embrace. However, it should not overtake us. So I think as, as a global business, as a global leader, you also need to understand the human nature. And you need to understand how you balance technology and the technology impact you have with what people can take on what people uh, perceive and what people can digest because we have more technology today than we are able to use. Uh, so I don't think there is a yes or a no to that, but it needs to be incorporated in, in, in as a tool and a way to connect. 
So uh, summarizing, I think you need to have a purpose with your leadership to go global. I think you need to encompass the social and sustainable responsibility and you need to use technology as a tool and, and understand human nature. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. I think you have connected, as you said, with what Tarun had said at the beginning. And many times I say that actually emerging multinationals have the CSR as part of their DNA because of where they act, where they are uh, leaders in, in all the challenges, all the human uh, challenges, poverty, etc., that are in these countries. So very good that you brought all these points. So now let me turn to Heinz. Uh, so we, the last uh, two questions I wanted to pose are related to this new world post-COVID that actually what you just said, Eva, is more important than ever. The new world makes us, has put back human lives at the center of any, everything. So in this new world, uh, do you think that uh, the, there is an increasing risk of Actually, many people say, no, we are going to change. But actually, some they also say, you know what? Inequality will increase. Inequality within countries, inequality among different countries. That can happen. You have very, very cheap assets right now in Brazil. And you have had also relatively cheap assets in India because the currencies, okay, now they have recovered a little bit, but for a while the currencies fell down. So do we see an increasing risk of takeovers by traditional multinationals from US, from Europe, for um, firms in India, for Indian firms? Hi, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, to be blunt, I don't see a risk for the moment. Um, I see it like people usually say in any risk is also a chance is there an increasing chance of being able to take over uh indian firm coming from a european investor or from an american but uh, or or let's assume we all would be a ceo of a european or an american or a south american company would we dare to go to india in order to purchase uh, an Indian company. To be honest, I would say at the current time, with the co of course, with the corona, I would not go for the moment. But not necessarily of the Indian situation. This is the second thing. But first of the European situation, because I think many, many European companies or multinational companies are hit hard by the uh, consequences of the corona. And I'm not sure whether everybody really oversees the problems these companies have at home. So being a foreign investor for India, I would be extremely careful uh, to consider any investment in India. European companies were that before uh, already very careful and they tried hard uh, in order to eliminate the risks when going to India, like in other like in other countries. So at home, we have problems with pension plans, with all the obligations we have. Uh, and I think before any company goes to India now, they first the problems at home have to be solved fully, and this applies for Europe, for Germany, for America whosoever. Um, the second thing is what I read recently, and I do not like to mention the name of uh, China and uh, India. I have never compared what many do, the two countries, but maybe our Indian friends have to help me. What I have heard is that uh, the, the Delhi government has put on, uh, or has put into effect a law that those that companies from the neighboring countries of India have to get approval in order to take over or to do anything in uh, India. I don't think that this law is done against, I say, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh. I think it's done against China. 
because the only country which really invested heavily in India in the last two years was China. Six billion US dollars investment in the last two years. That is something I would say. And I think here when the government of India has put a kind of hurdle and want to see whether these countries can or whether companies from China can uh, invest in India. By the way, the same thing happened in due to the Corona thing. The same thing happened in Germany. Uh, everybody who now invests in Germany has to go to the government and ask for approval. I, I don't think this is a good thing that the government is involved in everything, uh, but it's a law and it's done. So for me, it's not a risk that a foreign company uh, takes over an, uh, an Indian company. I think it would be a chance if somebody really would come and would invest into India, being after, let's assume, after the Corona time, whenever this will be. We tried to, uh, from uh, my company, we once tried long before Corona to speak with the government and try to be involved in insurance, yes, but also in infrastructure. So we tried to, we said, let's invest into building bridges or any, any kind of in infrastructure. And we were told, no, only India does it. Other You can argue about that. And if you see how much money, and there I see the risk that people don't come or companies don't come. If you see how much development money was injected into India in the last 10 years, 20 years. And when you see where you don't know whether you don't see where the money is, is invested. Uh, highways, hmm. there's only one highway between uh, Pune and Mumbai. Uh, this is uh, the costs for this highway were about hundred million dollars, but more than a billion dollars were given to India for improving the infrastructure. You don't know. Everybody thinks where is where is the money left? I, I don't have the answer, but I have an answer in mind, but I won't say the answer. I think I go over my time, Lurt. That's it so far. I see a chance for taking over a company, but not a risk. Uh, thank you very much. So, uh, what Heinz reminded us, that the crisis is everywhere. Also brought back, I think, an elephant in the room, that is China, in spite of the recent terrible incidents in the border that caused the lives of uh, army uh, in uh, army personnel in India. In spite of that, as you are reminding us, Heinz, uh, China has invested a lot in, Ch in India. China has invested a lot in Brazil. So as closing remarks, we just have, we are, have been, you all have been great with the time. Thank you very much. So in this new world, in this post-COVID world, in this post-globalization world, how Indian companies should change their strategies. And if you want, you can add a little bit, will Chinese investments continue growing or not? Heinz said, it seems that there are many laws, not only in India, everywhere in the world, preventing, preventing Spain, where I am right now, also laws preventing, trying to prevent uh, acquisitions. So China took advantage of the global financial crisis to become global. Will this do it again? So please, two minutes each. Tarun, the floor is yours. And then uh, Rajiv. Okay. So very quickly on China. I think, uh, you know, China is, uh, there is a sentiment, which is, uh, you can't go away from it. There is a sentiment to not buy Chinese products. There are certain government contracts which have been uh, annulled in the last few days. Uh, and so I think there is going to be uh, um, the, the prime minister has talked of uh, self-reliance. So we should look to try and even spend a premium, uh, but not buy Chinese mobiles just for a, a, which which is a large thing in India. 
so that's the scenario but uh, coming to the question uh, on um, you know what should indian companies change i think i i would offer three uh, solutions i think one of the things indian companies need to do is focus on the un sustainable goals um i think you know the virus is just a precursor of a much bigger impact that's going to happen due to climate change and and india is not pre- prepared i mean i i know in my, from a school business school perspective we've been talking about green finance green marketing green operations green logistics exchange a decade ago but every indian business has to look at it from a lens of a green sustainable future for themselves i think two is uh, embrace diversity uh, and diversity from across the world uh, i think this is a great time for indian companies to go talent hunting uh, i would love to see uh, you know there are 40 million americans without jobs i would love to see a few of them sitting in mumbai and delhi and you know they 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 can add to the uh, value proposition that india has uh and of course then indian companies have to up their game in terms of uh, an environment of continuous learning uh and skill development um so that's two and third i would say is you know it's been proven that you know world war 2 was won by the strongest the brits and the americans world uh, the cold war was won by the smartest the americans uh, mm-hmm. against the russians the future is going to be uh won the this covid war is going to be won by companies who are most adaptable and they they are the only ones who are going to be surviving so as a as a professor of strategic management i would like to just say you know i teach that 70% of your business should be on the core 20% on adjacent, adjacent businesses and 10% should be new innovation and and creating the future i would reject that model and i would say now companies need to look at 50 to 60% on core uh, 20% on agencies and at least minimum 20 to 30% on creating the future and i think if they can do that um indian managers who dealt with this will lead successful global businesses and be able to acquire them around the world thank you very much uh, uh rajiv please thank you uh so uh hinds uh, we have many more other highways than mumbai pune number 1 number 2 uh, since we are talking of the elephant in the room and that's not me uh, it's china uh india is not only the largest democracy in the world it's also the rowdiest so while that's a huge strength uh because democracy if you really define it that's what it is it's also a weakness now we have that strength and we can expand on it and build it into a really wonderful space a few little glitches here and there need to be fixed maybe slightly larger glitches However, Indian companies have this luxury of having a huge demand in their home country. But what we lack is good quality technology, not people. We have wonderful human beings. I mean, I I they remain unnamed as a lawyer. I work for a large number of multinationals and some of them who have set up uh, little uh, uh, manufacturing shops in India have been very impressed with the quality of the people we have. the point is do we have the right technology if indian companies can start acquiring what you mentioned cheap companies in brazil or in england or uh, in us or in germany cheap value i would say but with great technology we could then also expand to those countries for example become oem manufacturers to a bmw and manufacture that car in india which is being done right now as you speak but also bring in the oem guys the ancillaries so a lot of that can be uh, pushed and indian companies can really make a huge difference because the demand is here at the end of the day it's all about demand and yes there are a number of chinese a uh, uh, number of companies from other countries who work in china and i can tell you apple being one of them is actively looking at shifting to india and uh, right now if the figures are right about 52 billion dollars worth of apple products are exported out of china now that can very easily shift to india uh, if we have the right policy and the right format that's what i would say thank you very much rajiv uh, the size of its domestic market very important at this point marcelo what strategy should be changed besides using the shared value platform 
Well, I believe that for Indian companies to go abroad, it should export its best to be able to perform better in, in, in different countries. So knowing its own strength, and as a colleague has said, the level of Indian managers, the management of, of, of uh, capacity of, of some Indian icons on, on the world of multinationals today is, is very impressive. Uh, the, the, the performance of some of the Indian uh, multinationals is amazing. And it should use in those developing countries that they, they, uh, they go abroad, they should use those, those assets. And one of them is the capacity to open potentially new, fresh markets. A fresh market meaning below the, the economic line, a lot of the, 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 the developing country population is invisible to the traditional markets. India lives this in its own uh, country forever. And if it uses one of the knowledge, one of the experiences Indian, India has is to unlock those untapped markets of below the, the, the visibility line from a banking point of view, for example, or from others. So this is one, one knowledge India has that should really, really try to, to, to use abroad with great success, I would say, and advantage of, over other countries that do not have that kind of, uh, of experience. Thank you very much, Marcelo. Eva Lota, please. What? Yeah. Yes, thank you. So the question is, what kind of strategy should be changed due, due to the new future we see? And I would say for particularly also back again to the, the previous speaker said, uh, and I'm going back to the manager and the leadership aspect again. I think to be able to be innovative and open to the world, you also need to have the behavior context in, in your persona. And one that is extremely important is that you need to be humble, but you also need to be very, very curious. And you need to be using technology. As we heard, there are great people in India, but do we have the right technology? And I think the technology aspect in that is also to be able to actually lean back and, and let your old experience be disturbed by the big data and the insights that technology can give you to open up and to see new patterns and new new things shape in front of you that you didn't know before. So if you combine uh, the insight from big data, artificial intelligence with the right algorithms uh, in a curious open mind and an open heart uh, to the world, I think we have a really good future ahead of us in, in becoming more strategically aligned when it comes to business proposition around the globe. Thank you very much. And Heinz? Please. Well, I have two minutes, four seconds, even not that. Um, yeah, for me, again, I come back to the virus, which kills everybody here currently in the world. India, I think India, as being the Asia's hotspot for the, uh, for the virus, unfortunately, first has to do everything to get back control over this virus. I know it's very difficult. Personally, I think we can only get control if we have a vac vaccination, uh, a vaccine against that. And I think, I think this applies for everything, for every country. So India will be again a good uh, country with all his knowledge about technology, etc. But first, the virus has to be fought uh, significantly and has to be killed before it kills us. Well, thank you very much for reminding that human lives are center stage. And I would like to finish by what Tarun said at the very beginning about the sunrise and give the example of e-commerce in India, a bloody battle between everybody, Alibaba, uh, Amazon, um, Walmart. And then all of a sudden, from nothing or what seemed nothing, Reliance comes super strong, as you mentioned, with great investments in the possibility of a local company being at the end the winner. So I think this expresses this possibility of sunrise, great economy, belonging to the two trillion club, only nine countries in the world. So soft power, spirituality, things that also Eva had mentioned regarding the importance of 
putting things, what has to be first, has to be first, the long-term vision, sustainability, and uh, CSR. So very important in uh, India being in a swift, uh, sweet spot. So and on top of everything, I wanted to say thank you to you all, great insights, and all on time, the German timing prevailed mm -hmm. among Latins and Indians, and we were all on time. So thank That's you impressive. so much. Very <laughs> impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stay healthy, as we say these times. Thank you very much. Exactly. Thank you. And good spirits as well. Thank you.